Welcome everyone to Glenfair Family Church. We are so glad that you could join us this morning and as we gather together online. I have with me my friends Jordan and Bree, and they're going to be helping us lead worship this morning. Uh, so welcome them, and I, uh, I know that you'll enjoy it as much as I've been enjoying listening to their practicing. It's been amazing. So uh, let's go ahead and open in prayer, and then uh, they're going to take us away into the throne room. Uh, God, we love you, and we, we focus on you this morning. We magnify your name. God, we want to meet with you because we know, God, that it's your presence that uh, it's the only thing we need. God, because without you, there's, uh, there's no meaning. There's no, um, no purpose to it all. And um, God, we just, uh, we want to meet with you. We want to hear from you. And so we give you this time, and uh, we invite you into this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory. King above all kings. Come on, church. I know you this, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos? Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance The King of glory, the King above all kings This is amazing grace This is unfailing love That you would take my place I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. I sing for all that you've done for me.
Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood. trust the sweetest frame but wholly trust in Jesus name Christ alone cornerstone weak made strong the Savior's love through the storm Darkness seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every sky and stormy gale, my anchor holds a thing. this time of preaching and hearing from you, God, that you would open our ears to hear what you have for each and every one of us listening this morning, and you'd open our hearts to really understand, God, that you are here, you are present, you are a part of what we are doing. So speak through Pastor Tim as he delivers his message, and God, I just pray that uh, right where we're at, you'd be right there with us, and we would feel you this morning. We love you, and we thank you. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning again, family. It is so good to be here with you as we look at God's Word together. Today, the title for today's talk is Walking Worthy, and our passage today is going to be from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 6, and the big idea that we're going to be looking at is we will live up to our call to be like Jesus when we are unified on God. We will live up to our call to be like Jesus when we are unified on God. 
You know, we've been in this series for the last couple of weeks called Community Equals Family, and we've been going through the book of Ephesians, Paul's letter to the Ephesian church, rather. Um, And the beautiful thing about this particular book is that the way Paul wrote it, it's kind of like a primer for the church, how uh, the church should look, how the church should be, what the church should believe. And so for the first half of the book of Ephesians, Paul is laying out the beliefs of the church, the identity of the church, what makes you know, the core of who the church is. And then on the second half of the letter, it talks about kind of the action, the next steps, if you will, of being the church. And so as we have engaged in this topic for the last number of weeks, we've been specifically looking at, you know, what does it look like for us to be a family church? What does it mean for us to be a community? And we've been discussing a number of topics, but one of them specifically that's going to lead into our time for today is this idea of what is a Christian even. If the church is built on a, you know, is a body of believers, which we'll talk about a little bit later, and, you know, what are those believers? How do you define a Christian? You know, Christians were first called that at the city of Antioch at, uh, in, I believe it's Acts chapter 10 or 12 or something to that effect. And that word Christian literally means little Christ. And it was used as a, a term of derision uh, by many in, the, in that first century, um, kind of like a sneer at, you know, this new... Uh, new religion, this new sect of Judaism at that time. And so, what is a Christian? And kind of our loose definition that we've been working with throughout our time is, really, a Christian is someone who's endeavoring to be like Jesus. And what that means is that we would be like Jesus in our character, and that we would actually also do the things that Jesus did through our actions. And so as we ruminate, as we think about that question, what is a Christian, how do we live up to that name? How can we be worthy of that name? And just on the surface of things, there's a very real reality where we can never truly be worthy to be called a Christian, because we, we are not worthy. We, we are imperfect, and yet God has allowed us to be called that, and that is something, that's an identity that has been uh, built into the church throughout, um, throughout the centuries, throughout the millennia. And so, what is a Christian? Someone endeavoring to be like Jesus. I want to also start with some quotes, and I want them to read them to you today because I think they help sort of frame this idea of, of worthiness and that kind of deal. So uh, the first comes from an author named Brennan Manning, and he wrote this saying, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips and walk out the door and deny him By their lifestyle, that is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. Another quote by Mahatma Gandhi, he said this, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ. That's kind of interesting. And then there's this final quote that I want to share Uh, by C.S. Lewis from his preface to Mere Christianity. He says, When a man who accepts the Christian doctrine lives unworthily of it, it is much clearer to say that he is a bad Christian than to say he is not a Christian. Because ultimately our belief 
is what saves us. Our faith in Christ is what saves us. It's not on any merit of our own lives. It's not on anything that we have done. It's not on any particular, you know, earning of God's grace because grace is a free gift. And so because of that, that is what gives us that title of Christian as someone who is submitting themselves to the grace of God and is receiving that grace of God. And so what we're concerned with today is this idea of walking worthy. And uh, in thinking about today, there's um, this word that comes up in our passage today, as we'll find out in a moment, where uh, Paul says to live your life in a manner that is worthy of the call. And one of the illustrations of living a life worthy or living your life in the Christian life is a walk with God. And so to walk worthy would mean that we are endeavoring our best to live up to this name, this title, this designation of being a Christian, a little Christ, someone who represents Christ to the world. And not that we could ever earn it, not that we could ever deserve it, but that is a grace to us that we have been given that name. And so today we're concerned with the idea of walking worthy. Something I love about the idea of walking is, as I researched it earlier this week, is that you know, walking is, it's claimed, uh, it's even been researched by people, uh, I believe it was at Harvard or Yale or some prestigious university like that, and walking is one of the best exercises uh, to get started with and even, you know, arguably by some, you know, is one of the best exercises because it exercises, it, it engages your entire body. And so, in a very real way, when we're talking about walking in, in a physical sense, we're talking about engaging the totality of your physical ability, if you will. And in a spiritual sense, when we're talking about our journey in life, when we're talking about walking with God, when we're talking about you know, uh, another place in Scripture, Paul talks about, you know, running the race that's set before us. When we are talking about our walk, we're talking about something that engages the totality of who we are. You know, everything that is inside of us, everything of who we are and what we're like and, you know, the day-to-day -day interactions that we have through the highs and the low, through, you know, the exciting, through the, the mundane we're talking about the, the, you know, the forward motion and the pauses. We're talking about all of it. And so how do we live? How do we walk worthy? We're going to find out. And so our big idea for today, we'll revisit it, it it's this. I would submit to you that we live up to our call to be like Jesus when we are unified on God, when we're unified on the things of God, when we're unified in and around the, the things that God has given us to be unified on. And so today, I believe that we're going to learn some more about that. Now, the context for our passage today, Ephesians chapter 4, is that Paul was writing to a church in uh, in a region called Asia Minor. It was, uh, I believe it was north, northeast, no, northwest of uh, Judea. And uh, it, it was at this city, Ephesus was the city that was the convergence of all these major highways. And in a lot of ways, cities like Portland is a convergence of a lot of highways. Um, I can think of at least four or five off the top of my head just in this moment of highways that run through Portland. Ephesus was a hub. 
just like Portland in many ways is a hub. And the amazing thing is that as Paul was writing this letter, his intention were these things. He wanted to inspire the church there to remain true to the Lord and then also to align herself with the purpose and plans that God has for his church. And thirdly, to guard and defend the church against false teachers. And so this is a letter of encouragement. It's, it's not a letter of correction per se, but it is Paul casting vision to this local church in Ephesus to say this is what the church is to be like, that this is God's vision for the church. This isn't just Paul's vision for the church. It's really God's vision for the church. And so as we read Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, let us align ourselves with the purpose and plans that God has for his church. Amen? Amen. Let's open our Bibles together to Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, huh, excuse me. Ephesians chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. Paul speaking. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. See, there's that word walk. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Amen. So the first thing we learn from our passage is that walking worthy means <coughs> that we will root ourselves in what is essential. We will root ourselves in what is essential. Paul lists in verses 4 through 6, he lists seven unifying essentials for us as believers. The great thing about uh, a word-for-word -word translation, and I think you would even find in most translations that, uh, that are out there in English, is that there is a, uh, as you look at the words that are mentioned, when there's a repetition of something, you pay attention to it. And in our passage, there is a list of seven ones, if you will. And the number seven in Scripture corresponds with the idea of completeness. It's the Bible's number that says, ding, 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 think about it. This is a complete number. This is a complete set. And so Paul gives us seven unifying agents, seven elements that we should unify around. And they are one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. So let's take these in turn and just let's unpack each one and, and think about it. So the first is that he lists is one body. There's one community that uh, God has given to the church, that he's given to us as believers. I love in 1 Corinthians 12, it says, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. And what I love about that verse in correspondence with Ephesians chapter 4 is that there is one body. There is one church. Now, it may look different in different areas. It might look different depending on the, the location, but there is one body. And 
with many members, there's different functions to the church. There's different functions within our church, but there is one body. It's not two different bodies. It's one body. There is only one, and there's an emphasis on the one. And also in Second Peter 2, it says, as you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a ro- holy priesthood to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. The church is made up of people who are being redeemed and saved and transformed into the image of Christ. But that means that there's also a process to that. They're not instantly perfect in the moment of belief or in the moment of accepting God's salvation. So the church is made up of imperfect people. And yet, the beautiful thing about that truth is that we are to be a community that demonstrates God's grace through our unity. That means when we disagree with one another, which, believe it or not, it happens. When we have a grievance with one another, when maybe somebody rubs us the wrong way, it means that we can have grace for them. It means that we are to work in harmony with them. And to have one body, not to divide the body, but to have one. Another one that Paul gives us is one spirit. There is one Holy Spirit that we are given, God himself. And even though different denominations, different groups of Christians throughout the world might define the role of the Holy Spirit, and might, you know, have different ways of looking at who the Holy Spirit is and uh, how the Holy Spirit acts. You know, the Holy Spirit is God. The thing that I find most amazing is that the Holy Spirit was given to be our, our guide, to be our, to be our counselor, to guide us into all truth, to remind us of the things of God, to correct us where we need correction, to, um, to transform our lives from the inside out, to refine us and purify us and to bring us into the fullness of what uh, God has in mind for those who believe. And yet, what's most amazing to me is that as I, I engage in conversation with fellow believers, Oftentimes, talking about the Holy Spirit is something that divides us. Now, there's a number of reasons for that, and I think pride plays a huge role in that division. But how tragic that is, that the Holy Spirit, someone who should be a unifying factor for us, that Paul says should be a unifying factor for us, a unifying object, someone we rally around and we unify to, is used as some object to divide us. You know, in Mark chapter 3, when Jesus had performed a miracle and the Pharisees were attributing it to Satan, they were blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And Jesus makes this statement. He says, if a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And friends, the enemy of our souls, the devil, often uses what is meant to unify us to divide us. Because the devil seeks to steal, kill, and destroy. And he wants nothing less than to just destroy the church. And so I would encourage each and every one of you, wherever you're at in walking with the Holy Spirit and engaging with the Holy Spirit, unifying around the Holy Spirit, friends, understand that our brothers and sisters across the world believe in the same Holy Spirit you do and believe in the same Holy Spirit that is revealed to us in Scripture 
And we need to unify, not divide. Now, Paul also mentions that there is one hope. For this, I'd like to read from Isaiah chapter 35. I'll read the whole chapter because it's just so good. The prophet Isaiah speaking, he says of a future time when the Messiah would come, The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Now here, he's, he's talking about a dry desert wasteland, right? <clears throat> he says, strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have an anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap like a deer, the tongue of the mute sing for joy, for waters break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool and the thirsty ground springs of water. <clears throat> in the haunt of jackals where they lie down, the grass shall become reeds and rushes, and a highway shall be there, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. It shall belong to those who walk on the way, even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. Isn't that good news? Even if they are fools, even if they are sinners, They shall not go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there. But the redeemed, those who God redeems, shall walk there. (coughs) And the ransomed (coughs) of the Lord (coughs) shall return and come to Zion with singing Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Friends, the reason I wanted to take the time to read that entire chapter is because Isaiah is talking about a time when God's kingdom would be established, when the rule and reign of God would come again, when there would be hope again. There's all these images of hope. You know, for those who have weak hands, be strong. For those who are anxious, fear not, right? There's these images. I love this in verse 5, Isaiah 35, verse 5. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf unstopped. That's amazing deliverance and transformation just right there. That's streams in the desert. That is hope given to hopeless people. And friends, we as the church have been given a hope that belongs to our calling to be like Jesus. And that hope is the gospel. It's the good news that God saw us in our, in our distress, in our hopelessness, And he didn't want to leave us there. He wanted to engage. He wanted to step in. And friends, he came to save us. Jesus came to save us through the cross. And that is the good news of the gospel. That is a message that belongs to us as believers. That is a hope that we rally around. That is a one thing that we rally around. The hope that belongs to our call. It's something that drives us. It's something that moves us forward. And it's something that draws us together. It points us all in the direction of realizing and reflecting and 
passing along who Jesus is, what Jesus has done, and as a result, also what he's like. And we get to see that, and we get to model that, and we get to rally around that. I need to start hurrying up a little bit here. We're going to be here all day. We're also called to one Lord. Friends, we are citizens of a kingdom that is not of this world, ruled by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is the king on the throne. He is the one with all authority. And we are submitted to the king. As citizens of this kingdom, we submit ourselves to the king. He is our Lord. He is not just someone among us. He is the king. And so, as citizens, we embrace his will and his way for our lives. Jesus, in modeling how to pray, gave his disciples the words, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Also in Philippians 2, verses 5 through 11, Paul writes, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. We need to walk worthily and have the same attitude that Jesus had. Because though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. <clears throat> Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Watch this. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of the highest honor and gave him the name above all other names, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue declare <coughs> That Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Friends, we have one Lord. What you believe about Jesus is what brings us together. It's something that unites us. <coughs> Regardless of denomination, it's something that we rally around. It's something that binds us together and drives us forward. We have one Lord, one authority who is over us, and we are submitted to. We also have one faith, and isn't it good? One faith. I love what Paul says in, earlier in Ephesians, which we've already gone through a couple of weeks ago. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing, it is a, the gift of God. And also in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe that faith in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Our faith, what we believe in, what we put our faith and trust in is what is something that binds us together. It's something that gives us unity. <coughs> That whether we have differences with our brothers and sisters in Christ, we can still have unity because we have our faith. We can have common ground because, <coughs> because our faith is, is similar to each other because we unify around our faith. Similar to our faith, we have one baptism. The great thing about baptism is that it it illustrates, it demonstrates the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. <coughs> so because we have one Lord, because we have one faith, we also have one baptism, some action that we do to publicly confess to God and everybody that we believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and we are going to follow him with everything we've got. And that's great. That's what that illustrates. That's what it means. But something that this particular verse has been used for is that it, some people interpret it to mean the frequency of baptism. So you have 
one moment of baptism. One moment of getting into the water, so to speak. And I would just like to ask the question for you. What is more important, the quantity of the baptism or the quality of the baptism? Does a person only need, (coughs) excuse me, the smoke's getting to me, it appears. Is it, is it the number of times you're baptized that only one really counts and you only need to be baptized once and if you get baptized more than that, then you're a heretic? Is that what it is? Or is it the quality of the baptism, the fact that we all engage in this practice, this ritual, this sacrament of baptism? Which is it? I would submit to you that the heart of this passage in Ephesians chapter 4 is the quality of the baptism. It's the fact that all Christians everywhere enter the waters of baptism to initiate them into the community of faith. Whether that's once, whether that's three times, whether that's five times, I don't care. The point is that you get baptized. Now, full transparency, baptism is not what saves you. It's only, you know, grace through faith. It's only by God's grace that we're saved, through our faith, right? That is what saves you. Getting wet is not something that saves you. However, it is a practice that's important for us as the church because it's something that identifies us with Jesus is something that links us with Jesus' experience of dying to self and being raised to new life. And so I know from my own experience, I was baptized when I was eight years old, and I believe that that was a valid expression of faith. I wanted to be baptized. Um, My favorite story to tell is how uh, my parents and I, we went to church uh, one Sunday, and we came home, and as my dad is opening up the door to our house, um, I said, you know, Dad, I really want to get crucified. And he just stopped and looked at me and said, what do you mean? And I went on to say, oh, you know, like, I want to be up. We had a baptistry in that church, and like, I want to be up there and I want to you know have the pastor ask me the questions and to get dunked in the water that was a dunking church if if you couldn't tell and so um and so he's like oh okay you want to get baptized and um and so and I really believed it in that moment that's something that uh, I had a faith in Christ it's something I was growing in and learning about But there was a whole lot of life that happened between then and my adulthood. And there was a lot of guilt and shame of, you know, sin and struggle that I had been working through. And there came a point when I was about 24 years old where there was an invitation at this retreat I was at where, you know, if you need a fresh start, that you can be baptized. The, it, it's not the frequency. It just matters that you really mean it. And so that's what I did. And I, I went forward. I, I went through that experience. And that was an amazing moment where I got to declare to God and everybody that I was deciding to follow Jesus with everything that I've got, that I really at that point understood, yeah, it's a full life thing. It's something that engages my entire life. It's a walk. It's, it's walking worthy of that call. Not that I'm going to be perfect all the time, but that I'm going to be keeping in the same trajectory. You know, though a righteous man falls seven times, he gets back up again, that I'm going to keep pressing on to follow Jesus with everything I've got. And so, Friends, if, that's, if what I've said in the last five minutes has offended you about 
the idea of even being baptized more than once. You know, honestly, I want to be able to have coffee or tea with you or, you know, some kind of beverage where we can just share in community and share in conversation because I'd love to be able to talk with you. If you want to talk more about it with Pastor Stefan, that's okay. I just uh, don't let the conversation stop here, right? And so, but we are called to baptism. And finally, in this list, in this litany of of ones, we are given, we are called to one God and Father. This is the climax of this moment, these unifying elements that we rally around that bind us together. And as I was preparing for this message, I was trying to think, okay, so one unity, what, how, how does this all fit together? And as kind of a convergence of all these ideas, the verse that popped into my head was from John chapter 17. I don't have the exact address, but where Jesus, he's just had the Last Supper with his disciples, and uh, we read what's known as his high priestly prayer, where he is, he's not just engaging with the disciples, though he is, right? He's, it's kind of like this transcendent moment where Jesus is praying over his disciples and what's coming ahead. And he says these words in his prayer. He asks God, the Father, he says that they, meaning his disciples, that they may be one as you and I are one. That there would be a unity there that we experience because we identify with Jesus and because Jesus is one with God, that therefore we would become one as Jesus and the Father are one. That's amazing. This is Jesus' vision for his disciples, that they would live and work in relational unity in the same way that he is in relational unity with God the Father. The underlying image that I, I think we see in Scripture, and sometimes it's more explicit than others, but <clears throat> the image of the church is that of a relational people that are unified on God. And how tragic it is when we choose to divide, when we choose to separate from each other, when we, when we choose to let Satan steal away our unity, when we allow Satan to, you know, uh, kill our unity and destroy our unity through our pride and through our arrogance and through our, our feelings of wanting to be right. How tragic it is. Because the church is Jesus' bride. The church is, is a body, is, is something that Jesus died for. There's this great uh, song. It's, it's getting pretty old now. It's probably 12 or 13 years old now. But uh, it's called Savior King by uh, Hillsong Church. And um, there's this line um, where the, the lyricist wrote, let now your church shine as the bride that you saw in your heart as you offered up your life. And that picture that the church would be this shining bride, this shining example that we would be that city on a hill that Jesus died to create. That's an amazing picture. How much, though, do we, do we settle for squabbling over certain pet topics or, you know, different opinions that we have or we, we want to hold on to this grudge that we have or this hurt that somebody did to us, but we're not willing to fight for unity 
Or worse yet, we engage in gossip, which then just hands it all over to the enemy anyway, right? Walking worthy means that we will root ourselves in what is essential. To be a, quote, good Christian doesn't mean that we are necessarily perfect. However, what it does mean is that we are grounded, we are rooted in what is essential. Our walk is consistent in pursuing unity in these seven things, at least, and that we would seek unity in the bond of peace, in God's peace for his church. We will live up to our call to be like Jesus when we are unified on God. Walking worthy also means that our lives will show it. Becoming like Jesus is a lifelong pursuit. Yes, there are moments where, where you know, certain surrender moments where there are, you know, these milestones where we can we can look to those moments and say, yes, I set myself apart for God there. Yes, I gave God my heart there. Yes, I, I, I made him the Lord of my life here. Yes, I, I, I did these things or this event happened, this experience happened for me. But becoming like Jesus, being transformed into the image of God, that redeemed image of God where God is redeeming us back into what he created us to be in the first place. It's a lifelong pursuit. It's not something that happens overnight. And it's, some, it's that lifelong pursuit of everyone who has decided that they are going to follow with Jesus with everything that they've got, endeavoring to be like Jesus and doing what Jesus did both in that character and that action, and we've kind of already talked about the action of it. But what about the character? What what was Jesus like? What are the what are some descriptions of what Jesus was like? Because I believe that when our lives show it, it's going to be because we are receiving that life from Jesus. And then, as a result, we're going to be also reproducing what has already been produced in us. That our lives will show it because we are producing more fruit, which has more seed in it, to create more disciples who look like Jesus and are endeavoring to live like Jesus and on down the line. Or, as the phrase has been coined in the last number of years, make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And that that is the complete cycle of making disciples and being followers of Jesus. And so, our lives will show it. Walking worthy means that our lives will show it. There are five Jesus-like characteristics that are described in Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> we are called to live with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. So we are called to humility, to gentleness, to patience, to loving, and to peacemaking, to reconciliation. And doesn't that really capture what Jesus came to do? That he was going to show us what it looks like to build a life that is rooted in and established on love, on the love of God. Something I love I came across some old notes of just this idea of humility, which is kind of, it, it's a summary of the other, uh, the characteristics as well. But with humility, that would have been a very countercultural command or a countercultural action. Because in Ephesus, what was seen as good and noble and virtuous was to be proud and arrogant. But yet, Paul is saying to these 
Ephesian believers, these Gentiles who have been recently converted to the way of Jesus, he's saying, be humble. Do something that's so against the grain of what you're used to that it's going to point to Jesus, that it's going to point to how different your life actually is now that you are following Jesus. And as these are just different descriptions, it's not like um, their actions of that were being uh, called to have to pursue these specific actions. But I do think that as we follow Jesus, as we submit ourselves to him, that these are areas of our life that start to be transformed, that instead of being proud and arrogant, it doesn't mean that I'm not going to be proud and arrogant uh, at any time, but that, you know, most of the time, maybe I'm going to show that there's more humility in my life than pride or selfishness. You know, in gentleness, maybe for those people who are, have been more aggressive in life, that maybe they, they discover new ways of expression and being more gentle and uh, being uh, more approachable that way. Or with patience, oh my Lord, that is a lifelong <laughs> pursuit of learning to be more patient. And um, I think it was a dangerous thing the day when I asked God, you know, Lord, teach me patience. Because it just feels like there's so much more that happens throughout life where each step of the way it's like I'm being asked more and more to be more patient, be loving, be peacemaking. And all of this points us to how Jesus was humble. That he, uh, as we read from Philippians earlier, he didn't see equality with some, God something to be cling to, but he took on the form of a servant that he taught us how to, to serve. As we see gentleness, as we see Jesus be gentle throughout, um, throughout the Gospels to those who are uh, hurt and broken or those who are maybe the more marginalized of society, um, he is more gentle with them, being patient with those who need patience and long-suffering, and um, that he showed love to everyone that he came in contact with. In all of this, he was leading us to this place of reconciliation, of being made right with God and with each other. And so for us as the church, as people endeavoring to be like Jesus, we're endeavoring to show these characteristics. And um, it's not like we're just muscling through like, oh, I'm going to be more patient. But what it means is that we are we might have to make cognitive choices saying, yeah, I'm going to, boy, that is trying my patience right now. <sighs> right? Or, you know, seeking out to make peace with each other even when we have disagreements. To find that common ground, those common ground things that we have. Those seven ones, that complete list of ones. Friends, the fruit of lives lived in a worthy manner are these characteristics. Humility, gentleness, patience, loving, peacemaking. Because they show that we're becoming less like the world, less selfish, less proud, and more like Jesus, more like our King. And as citizens of this kingdom, we are starting to walk more and more in the way. And frankly, it's going to take everything that we've got. It's going to take every spiritual muscle fiber in our being to walk this out, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. With Paul, he made the statement, he says, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. That means it's important. You don't urge somebody to do something not important. It was an important thing. And so my encouragement to you as we close out today, we live up to our call to be like Jesus when we are unified on God. Um, uh, you know, Jordan and uh, Bree, they're going to come up in just a moment. And 
um, they're going to lead us in the song, Build My Life. And what, <laughs> what an amazing song to close us out. The, the opening line is, worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise that could ever be. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Friends, God is calling you through this passage to step up, to begin making strides, walking towards, walking worthy. And it, it's not something that's going to be an overnight thing, but it's a lifelong journey. It's something that we're going to endeavor our whole lives to pursue because we're pursuing Jesus with everything we've got. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for your word this morning. Thank you that your mercies are made new each and every morning and that as we have gotten to wake up and we've gotten to worship and receive the word, God, you have been giving this to us and you've given us this idea, this concept of unity and living like you. God, forgive us for the times when we've been wrong. Forgive us for the times when we've, we, we've chosen our pride and have been too proud in our, our dealings when we, when we have sought division over unity, when we've allowed the enemy to, to steal away our joy, to kill our, our, our unity and to destroy what you want to create in us. God, we, we want your vision for the church. We want your vision for our community, for our family, for our lives. God, we want to align our hearts with yours. So as we continue on in the service, God, we, we ask that you come meet with us, Holy Spirit. Come meet with us, Jesus. Come meet with us, Father. We want to hear from you. We want to talk with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. And holy, there is no one like none beside you open up my eyes in wonder show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me worthy of every song Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name. 
Jesus, the only one who could ever say it. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, Lord. Oh, we live for you. There is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up my eyes in wonder, show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those Thank you for joining us today as we have gathered in worship. I believe that we have we've met God here in this place. And so as we go from this time, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Have a great week. And I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and i will put my trust in you alone and i will not be shaking holy and holy there is no one like there is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart. And